Grüezi und willkommen zu Pizza and Playlist. Das ist der Aki und ich bin der Stefan. But now I think we switch to English. Sure, certainly. Because uh, as we are both from Basel in Switzerland, but I guess most of people watching us aren't, so... Let's speak English then. Let's do it. So, on your way here, and as you know, the format is called Pizza and Playlist. Were, were you listening to music? To a playlist? I, I usually don't work with playlists, but I have my songs on my on my uh, device, um, and, you know, and it's always been like, I update it every now and then, and then I just listen to them, but I barely, I barely listen to music um, anymore, unless I'm traveling, yes. Okay, and when you do, what, what, what songs are in... Um, so I like, I like uh, reggae dub, I like... Uh, old school, deep underground house music. I listen to classical music, Chopin. I love Chopin. Um, yeah, that's about it. That's about it. Yeah. Those three genres uh, are, are close to my heart. Yeah. And I think that gives us a good possibility just to look quickly back. And do, I mean, we met a long time ago. <laughs> and... Uh, Probably you can say something about your, your, um, the old days. The old days, yeah, when we met. Uh, the old days, for me personally, were mostly focusing on a career. And I ended up studying uh, econ economics and uh, IT. And so I ended up coming back to the United, uh, from the United States to, to, to Switzerland, to Basel, ended up working for an IT company for two years, and then I switched over to a bank. So I worked for a bank for several years, and the last two years of that employment at the bank, I also managed the nightclub, and that's where we met. Exactly, yeah. Um, um, I think it was my partner who found you, and... and You were an amazing DJ. So you had your dedicated day, right? You had your dedicated evening. Yes, true. Uh, and yeah. and uh, people came and they, they enjoyed the music and, and you felt what they wanted to listen. And yeah, and that's how, that's how our friendship started. Exactly. But you mentioned before you came back from the US. Uh, I think there's an interesting reason why you were in the US. Basketball. Yeah, that's, that's my first love. My, my, first, my first love, yeah, my first passion. Um, I always played basketball uh, from from a relatively early age on, because I'm a I'm a tall dude. <laughs> I'm more than two meters tall, and um, so uh, yeah, uh, I had a little bit of talent. I ended up playing for the Swiss national team, and I play, played professional. And my dream was to play in, in college in the United States, which I ended up doing. Um, yeah, I went over there when I was I think 22. And I ended up playing three years uh, college ball. Um, yeah, but that was I think that was the zenith of my my career. Um, but then also the the studying part um, and the degree, my bachelor's degree, then kind of changed my focus. Uh, I think at that age you kind of dream to become a basketball superstar and you know you play basketball, play the NBA or whatever professional in Europe. Only a small percentage of people can achieve that and yeah with the consequences of sacrificing your health and your body and so I, I, I was start, I started to become more interested in, in, in you know doing work with uh, uh, you know my degree and, and I ended up uh, working for an IT company and then eventually I, I head over to the, uh, to the, uh, to the bank. Funny enough, now uh, that I'm much, much older, I, um, I'm, I'm picking up basketball again. It's just a completely different, you know, us old folks, uh, we still want to shoot some hoops. <laughs> um, fun fact is that we played a, a, a tournament in Finland four years ago, and there's different, different levels of, um, of competition, and there was even an over 80 league. So there were people from... Uh, it was, uh, A Russian team, uh, an American team, and, uh, an Argentinian team. I think Brazilians were there too, over 80. And there were ballers, old men, still balling, still hooping, still shooting. Just very, very slow. 
But it was beautiful to watch. Yeah. It was fun. It was very fun. Yeah. yeah. It was more about coming together, celebrating the the joy of of basketball. Mm. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm I'm picking up that on that again, just on a very slow pace. And I mean, that's just the beginning of your story. And mm. you you went a long way. Can you tell us about it? Well, you know, if you have two jobs, one during the day at the bank and, and one during the night at a club, bar, lounge, whatever it was, you don't get much sleep. And as much as I enjoyed it for the time being, um, I eventually burned out. I, I, I just did too much. And um, I became sick. I... I I had enough. I, I needed to. I needed to change something. I knew there's a little voice in the back of my head that says, "Hey, listen, uh, your health is important too, and you're not going to be 17 for the rest of your life. So, think of something else." So, I needed to get away. I think I needed to get away from that environment that just is so much focused on on work and and also. Uh, you know, performing and, and delivering and, 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 you know, it was too much. So I, um, there were some changes coming from the bank and I uh, decided to uh, leave the bank and just go as far as possible. And I went to Argentina to travel. And I think there was this key moment in, um, in the very south of... Uh, of Argentina, the very beautiful glacier, they say it's, I think it still counts one of the last remaining glaciers that is still growing despite climate change, um, where I sat down and I, you know, I, I, I meditated a little bit, just found myself, you know, just at ease with myself and I reconnected with nature again. And that was the key moment for me when I said, okay, nature gave me back my, my health, my, 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 you know, my love for the four elements. And that's when I decided to, to refocus my, uh, my, my vision, my, my, my doing, and help nature uh, to conserve it. So that was the big, big changing moment mm -hmm. in, in my life. Um, I continued to travel because that was also starting to become a passion, a new passion for myself, just seeing environments that you were not used to, uh, you know, understanding new cultures, new foods, new, 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 uh, you know, surroundings. Um, so, uh, yeah, after six months, I went back to Switzerland and I started to dissolve everything that I accumulated until this, this, time, this point in time. Because, you know, if you are working in the bank, you're on the forefront of the capitalistic system and we need to accumulate, we need to buy, we need to consume, we need to, you know, and then you have all these toys, a car and these designer suits and, um, you know, all kinds of stuff, just so much stuff and that keeps you grounded. So there was this moment when I realized you, you don't really work for yourself, you work for BMW, you work for Hugo Boss, you work for Möbel Pfister, you work, all these kind of brands that just, you know, they need you to continue to function in that system. So I needed to break out of this. And by selling off and dissolving all the stuff that I had accumulated, it became, I became lighter, I became, you know, disconnect, I disconnected more and more and more. It took me three years. And when I, when I sold off my, my car, which was the last big, big chunk that I uh, owned, or it owned me, to be discussed, um, that's when I really felt liberated. And um, yeah, that, that, was, that was a milestone, I would say, in my life. Um, I continued to travel, um, which again, I started to realize that this also is a, a privilege that we have. Us, especially in Switzerland, we're so well protected, we're so well off. We can just go anywhere we want. We can travel, we can look at the most beautiful places, and we go back. And what is there done? There's nothing. We didn't do anything. We didn't um, uh, improve anything by going there. It's just feeding your ego about saying like, hey, I've been to the Himalayas, I've been to, you know, um, 
the, 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 the biggest glacier in the world, or uh, I did the train ride through India, it's me, me, me. It's again, it's feeding your ego. Mm -hmm. Same thing, same thing. Um, but that's another thing where I decided to more, you know, dedicate myself still to traveling, but I want to do traveling more with a sense. And mm -hmm. that's when I started to volunteer. Mm -hmm. And my first, uh, my first um, opportunity to volunteer was with an, an NGO in Madagascar. Um, they're called Reef Doctor, and they did marine marine uh, conservation. And because of, during the travels, I started also to dive. I started to fall in love with the underwater world. Um, I think that was the next logical step. Um, after that, I did uh, apply for a master's in Costa Rica, where I then focused solely on marine conservation, and I did my, my thesis in co uh, coral co uh, restoration. Mm -hmm. Continued to, um, uh, to volunteer after that, uh, did my thesis. I wrote it in, in the Philippines when I worked for an NGO in the Philippines. And after two and a half years there, I decided to found my own NGO. And that's now almost eight years ago. So we're talking about Coral Life now. Correct. Uh, the name of, of the NGO is called Coral Life. It's mm -hmm. a, I registered it in, in Switzerland, in Basel. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit proud, a little local pride, which is fine. And uh, yeah, uh, we started tiny, tiny. We came up with the name, or I came up with the name, and, and um, you know, a simple logo and a first project. And yeah, and here we are today, eight years later. And now you're a well-known coral gardener, I must say, right? <laughs> I'm not so sure about well-known. I, I think uh, there's a few people now, more or less, they're starting to understand that Coral Life is, is establishing itself like as, as a brand, if you want to say that. Yeah. It's still an NGO. It's a non-profit. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to make sure that it stays that way. And if we stay not... I don't want to become like this huge NGO and, and you know, like... 60-80% of, of all the funding goes into overhead and, and um, you know, expenses and, and, you know, basically run like a, 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 a company, a company that is focusing on profits. I, I'm, I'm an NGO and I'm focusing on the health and the well-being of corals. And that is the, the credo, that that's the main focus of, of the NGO. It's a passionate... Um, work so to speak mm -hmm. and and everybody who, who chips in who helps out at the moment they are also volunteers including myself mm -hmm. um, but then we have projects you know every project um, uh, there's a lot of work to be done and that is part of a budget um, and so people who are involved in these projects they can get a pay because I think you know compensation should be done fair um, for work that you do and mm -hmm. Um, oh, what was that? A friend of mine said a very good quote. He told me, there's always a misconception about NGOs because people assume, oh, you're an NGO, so you work for free. Like, no, no, that's not the case. Um, you know, <laughs> just because we are an NGO doesn't mean that we work for free, that where others, what others destroy with a bonus. <laughs> yes. It's not that case. I think it should be fairly compensated mm -hmm. just as much. Anyway, that's a different story. So how did the NGO develop? I mean, in the talk we had just before we started recording, uh, you gave me a little bit of insight how it works now. Can you describe that? Sure, sure. Um, so it started, started tiny, tiny. Um, in a, in, with a small with a small project in Greece, um, and I, you know, had a little bit of savings left, and I, I just took everything and put it in that small little project, uh, sponsored it myself. Um, it was just one table, and when I take say, say a table, that is just a format where we uh, attach corals um, so they can grow. Uh, eventually, we take these corals and we uh, we outplant them. So one table can hold about. Yeah, between 80 and 120 corals. Mm -hmm. 
And that was, that was the first project. Um, it didn't work out very well, and, um, but it led to a conference that I attended in Hawaii, which is like the International Coral Reef Society, where networking is being done. I met some fabulous people. They connected me with a project in, uh, in, in Jamaica that was done there, which gave me a little bit of money, which I reinvested into another project in the Philippines. So then um, the amount of tables started to grow. We had, uh, uh, I think, about 15 tables. And um, that eventually led to a project in the Seychelles. Um, and still, still very young, um, uh, but I was able to, to involve also audiovisuals. We had a nice, nice video to be created for that. And then at some point I received call, a call from an individual in the, in, in the Maldives. Um, and we started to have uh, a project there. Um, which led to another project in Maldives, and now the biggest project that we have has 432 of these tables. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, it's definitely it's, it's a new milestone, um, and it's, it's just continuing like that. I have to say it's unfortunate, because the bigger the projects become, that means also the need for corals is more and more. That means also the destruction of corals is more and more becoming aware. Uh, uh, people are aware of it, and it's it's just uh, it's the natural state that we are in now at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, I'm trying my best um, to to have as many coral projects as, as possible all over the world. Um, to find new sponsors that that can support our work, um, and if I have you know 20, 30, 40 partners all over the world, and everybody's working on coral restoration. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. So now I listen to you talking about corals. The way you talk about it is, on one hand, I can hear, of course, the passion for the corals. Mm. But how you talk with uh, investing and sponsors and partners, mm. I still hear the bank guy. Is that, is that true? <laughs> <laughs> Very good observation. <clears throat> I have to say to that, to a certain extent, I'm very um, grateful to have gone through... An, uh, a, a bachelor's degree program um, which taught me about accounting, that taught me about financing, that taught me about um, you know marketing, uh, the IT side of it, creating websites and all these kind of things. This, these are all skills that I learned um, that I was able to apply at the bank. In the bank, obviously, you talk with clients, you talk about money, you talk about investment, we talk about return on investment, which is a huge, huge thing, not just in the banking world, but also in conservation. Now, all these skills that I accumulated, and I think, I believe, I want to believe that this, is, this accounts for every job. There's, sometimes you're in a job and you say, oh, what, what am I doing? Um, I'm just a an easy, a simple clerk, but everybody has a skill that he or she is very, very good at that can be used for conservation, for example, just in, the, in a small scale. It doesn't have to be, I'm saving the world, I'm saving the ocean. If you save one tree at a time, good for you, good for you. You just have to figure out the way how to do it. So anyway, all these skills I am using still now, and I run the NGO basically like a company, um, so I have a budget, I have a, an annual report, I, I have to do accounting, uh, um, marketing is a part of it, sales, I have to, you know, uh, find new clients, I have to do fundraising, I have to talk with people who have money, who want to give money, and you have to understand their language. Conservationists and finance people, they speak two different languages, they are not on the same level, but I think I'm a quite a good bridge, so to speak, in between. I understand how they speak and I understand what we want. So I'm usually quite good at, at bringing those two together on the same table and we discuss how we can move forward together. Because I met tons of people who have the best hearts and the best intentions and they said, let's go save the world. I want to plant a million trees. Give me the money. Where is it? Oh, I have no clue. They have no clue about that. So... Yes, as much as I'm glad that I'm not really part of the banking world anymore, as much as I'm grateful to have gone through that experience, but I'm just using it 
for conservation, for the coral, and by becoming more like an advocate, advocate for, for, for corals. Um, because, you know, if we just leave them as they are, doesn't, it's not really the best situation. So we need individuals that, that step up and, and they speak for the corals and they take action for the corals. And it looks like you have been very successful the last few years. You have even given TED TEDx talks, right? <laughs> so I think for a lot of people, and especially people watching, uh, you must be living the dream. Can you <laughs> can you connect to that? What, what do you think about that? And uh, do you still have other dreams left? Um, the dream, the dream. Let's say. For people who look at me, they they certainly think I live the dream. Um, it's not that I want to give up the lifestyle that I have now. I, I love it. Um, but nobody really believes me that I'm working hard. Um, because I work in the Maldives, I work in the Seychelles. I work in places where people usually go to do vacation. It's like, ah, oh, you live, you, you work in the Maldives. You, how, is it, how is it on the beach? It's still a workplace. It's still a workplace. Um, I'm confronted with the effects of climate change every day, and these are becoming more and more challenges. You have disease outbreaks, you have rising uh, temperatures, you have rising sea levels, the storms are becoming more intense, the, the seasons are completely messed up, you, you have uh, in, in invasive species, you have uh, loss of biodiversity. All these things are real, and I see them every day. So... It is challenging, um, and we're just trying to find solutions how to how to cope with that, how to improve it, how to bring it back how it was 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, so it is it is a tough job. Um, yes, it is in nice places. So I'm, I'm grateful that I can travel. I'm grateful that I can be in places that is that are nice usually. Um, and yeah, I, I have a certain level of freedom. And that uh, I think that is also why people call it the dream, so to speak. Yeah. So, what would be the next logical and important step for you? What are you looking forward to? Um, so, I, I want to grow, not as an organization that has ten thousand employees, and I don't want to do that. Um, I want to have a core team, let's say twenty twenty people max. And they are all responsible for, for coral uh, projects. And what I want is I want to empower um, the new generation. I want up-and-coming um, conservationists to be heard, to be uh, enabled to do conservation work, um, to uh, train them in their leadership, to take on responsibilities or ownership of these projects and make these projects success, successful. Um, obviously, I, I, I have a, uh, a, special, a special look for, for female leaders because I wanna, I'd like to empower women a little bit more than men because this is, even in the conservation world, it is still uh, something that is run by, by, uh, by males, by men. Um, so I have uh, a special eye for that and also indigenous people um, if we can work with local stakeholders, preferably indigenous, that, that can bring in indigenous knowledge into conservation, that is also a huge win. Um, because we need to listen to the elderly, we need to listen to people who live on site, on the ocean, live from the ocean, and if we can empower those, conservation becomes much, much easier. So... Oftentimes, I do see the challenges as a conservation organization because it's another way that the West is going to developing countries telling them what they have to do. Sometimes even with the best intentions, but that's not the right way, I believe. You have to um, sit down with the local stakeholders, listen to the problems that are usually created by the West and the developing countries are the suffering partners and listen to what the problems are and then empower the local stakeholders to come up, step up and, and find solutions and then we support these solutions. Yeah. I'm really excited and looking forward to what's coming next from, from your side. Thank you. So you talked a lot about work. 
mm. when there's some spare time apart from basketball. <laughs> <laughs> what what are you doing in your free time? Um, I do work a lot. Um, the beautiful thing is that I I have flexible hours. So whenever I'm, I'm I feel like it, I open my laptop and I, I do work. Um, that can be at any point in the, during the day or during the night. Um, I do have a little side project. Um, I, I want to... Uh, traveling is another passion that I have. And I do want to continue to explore uh, nature. Maybe not just the ocean, but also... I think it's a bit unfair just to focus on the oceans. Because mountains are just as beautiful. Rainforest or any forest or um, grasslands, wetlands, whatever. Just raw nature. Um, I want to explore more. So I think I'm going to build a van just to, to live in the van and, and travel around and head east, uh, maybe to Nepal all the way uh, and see all the beautiful countries uh, along the way, uh, see where I end up. So th I think that is the next personal project that I'm going to attack. So that sounds exciting as well. Looking forward to get some news from this side as well. So Pizza and Playlist is the format. Uh, we talked about the playlist, we talked about everything else in between. I think now it's time for the pizza. And as the magic of the media has it, let's grab the pizza right here. I asked you how you like your pizza and you said just a margarita. Just plain and simple, yeah. Is that, uh, is that just why you, that you like it like that or is that part of your credo as well? Well, to be honest, um, from the day I started to um, sell pretty much everything I owned, um, I, I had the credo of uh, traveling light. Mm -hmm. And that is not just because of the travels, that's also a, a synonym for, for traveling light through life. Because I don't own anything and I like things as simple as possible. Um, and, and the basic pizza... The margarita is just a very perfect, perfect example of, of, uh, of a good life with not too much on top of it. <laughs> Beautiful, beautifully said. I won't um, add anything to it. Mm. A good day. Are you going to take? Yes, thank you. Mm. So we grab the pizza. Take care. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Ciao. <laughs> Merci. Okay.